What's up, Raging Nation? How's it going? This is Alex Yu, and you're watching The Road to Beast Wars. This is just a web series where we're talking about the production of Transformers Rise of the Beasts. This is episode number 14, and we got a lot of stuff to talk about. We're just going to jump right into it. And I first want to give a big, big, big thank you shout out once again to this amazing Instagram account, and that is Transformers Alt Modes. If you want the latest and greatest set reports, set photos, and videos, do follow him because right now he is the number one source for all these amazing on-set, on-location photos. Like, wow! Like, what a what a what an amazing what an amazing guy! <laughs> because he's providing this for all the fans. And he's showing us everything that he sees and he's going out of, of, of his way to get these photos and videos for us. And I got to say that like, I, I'm like, I'm so appreciative of what you do. Keep on doing what you do because you're helping to make the journey so much more exciting. The film is coming out next year and it's going to be one hell of a ride. And that is thanks to, to fans just like you because you guys, uh, you, you make it so exciting for all of us. And of course, uh, now I have something to talk about. So thank you so much for that. We're just going to jump right into it. And uh, we're going to talk about, look at these amazing clean shots of, oh my God, I almost said it. <laughs> look at these amazing clean shots of Mirage. This looks so beautiful. Seeing it from this angle, and then seeing it from this angle, and then to this angle, you can see how clean Mirage is. Had to, to pause there just like for like a millisecond. <laughs> you can see how clean Mirage is, and he's silver, and he's uh, 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 that light shade of blue on those highlights, and he just looks great. I'm getting more and more um, used to it. Not used to saying calling him Mirage, but I'm, I'm, I'm really growing um, more uh, uh, like, um, like I, I'm liking it more. I'm liking this this uh, this this um, this look a, a lot more. It's really growing on me, so uh, I'm really really happy about that. Uh, now check this out. This is from Rick Pans sixty nine, and this was a bit of a surprise. This is the uh, the holding area of where um, uh, the vehicles are being used for the film. There's four jazzes. <laughs> there I go. <laughs> there are four mirages. Check that out. Okay, we already know there's going to be multiples of mirage, uh, but I didn't know there's going to be this many. There's, of course, the stunt car and the hero car. Now, why are there doubles of that? Why are there so many more versions of of mirage? Like, I get there's going to be the, the 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 camera car, and by that I mean the. Um, uh, I don't even know what it's really called, but it's rigged to have someone drive it, okay? There's that third version, but I didn't know that there were gonna have two more of, of what could potentially be the hero and the stunt car. Now, of course, a lot of us are gonna think right away because Mirage is who he is. You know, in G1, Mirage has the ability to create holograms. He has the, the ability to, to go invisible. Um, now, could that be possible? I know a lot of fans are gonna think this, is he going to be creating holograms of himself to make, um, you know, make a, a clones of himself? One of them is an illusion, the other one being a real thing. Highly possible. I'm not going to rule that out. Okay, I'm not going to rule that out at all. Um, now, of course, I could be totally wrong, and these could just be multiple versions of Mirage, so that they can do more stunts in case one gets busted. They can make replicas of him uh, because. Um, uh, you know, they need to, but it's also possible, and this is the fan speaking in me, that there's going to be a scene where Mirage creates another version of himself or multiple versions of himself to evade cops or evade uh, Decepticons who can't tell the difference. That would be really, really cool because that's full on G1. That's a G1 ability. And to bring that into the live action film, into this film where we're seeing Mirage represented for the first time, that would be super cool. So uh, I hope that's what happens and uh, we shall soon find out. Now let's go back to talking about uh, these police cars. Now these uh, New York City police cars are on their side. The first time I showed it to you on the um, uh, on a previous episode, I only showed you one police car, okay? Now there's two of them. Now you're probably thinking, well, why do we need to talk about this? 
because we've already seen it. It's not an Autobot or a Decepticon. Like, what's the big deal? Well, <laughs> okay, you gotta you gotta look beyond face value. At face value, we just have cars on their side, police cars on their side, and obviously they're involved in a police chase. Okay, obviously they're involved in a chase or some kind of battle sequence which requires them to be on their side. Okay. Well, there's a lot more to that. Okay, so let me just um, let me just. Uh, 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 divulge. Like, I don't even know what divulge even means. I heard it being used in a sentence before, so I think that I'm using it correctly. But in any case, let's just like uh, talk about this a little bit more on a, on a, on a, uh, on a deeper basis. Okay. So the cars are on the side. There are these things that are holding it on its side. Okay. Uh, now I saw a video where the vehicles have been stripped out completely of its entire interior. Okay. Something is going to happen to these cars besides being on their sides. Okay. Are they just going to be on their sides when we first see them in the film? No, they have to have, it has to tell a story. They have to make their way from being on their, you know, upright and then making their way on their side. And not only that, do they just get put on their side or is something going to happen to them? These cars are going to get flipped. Okay. These cars are going to get lifted up and flipped. And, and if they were just going to be regular cars, um, they would, um, you know, they would be on their upright position. They would be uh, like put not on their side. There's a reason why they have to be put on their side. And there's, that's why the, that's what makes these vehicles special. I know that's me spending a lot of time talking about some cars that are just eventually going to be seen for like two, two or three seconds, but it just tells you that this is part of a much larger scene. Okay. Something is going to happen to these cars, obviously going to get destroyed, flipped, thrown around, exploded. Uh, but this is just indication that two of these vehicles are going to get flipped or something happened to them. But there's something special about these vehicles in the sense that they needed to do something. They need to rig them up. They need to rig them up so that they perform uh, the task that they're supposed to do in, in, this, uh, in this stunt sequence. So that's why they're on their sides. Otherwise, they'd just be on their, their, you know, on their, you know, on, on their wheels. All right, so um, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Uh, now here's an aerial shot of the uh, uh, Jean of the Parc Jean Drapeau, and this is where the the Hammond Pavilion is located. It's a fictional building that's going to be used for the film in the, in the New York City setting, and this is a wide shot taken from the drone, and what you see here is a grander view of of uh, of, of this setting, this location, and all the action that's going to take place there. Obviously, Hammond Pavilion is a, a fictional uh, spot, so that's why they only build the front, and then the rest of it's going to be created by blue screen, and then everything behind it is just like the, you know, behind the scenes, okay? So, of course, we're not going to see beyond that, but this is the backdrop for a, a larger action sequence. Here's another shot of it, and now we're getting a little bit more up close. Now you're seeing more of the damage on these structures on the sides. This is before you enter the building. Uh, so that is very interesting. It makes me wonder how big these enemies are. And by enemies, I mean could be Predacon, Terracon, Decepticon. We don't know how big are these guys. Are they going to destroy it with their bare hands? Are they going to throw an Autobot through it? Or they're just going to shoot at it and thus the, the structures crumble? That's what I'm curious about. Essentially, we want to know what kind of action sequence is being taking place here. Uh, here's a shot of the lot behind the blue screen. And you can see there's a lot going on here. Uh, there's um, This is where they keep all their, their props and their vehicles and their uh, anything else that they might need that won't be seen on camera. And it makes me wonder, what is the Hammond Pavilion? Okay, What is it in relation to the rest of the story? Well, it turns out that the Hammond Pavilion is actually part of, or what I'm assuming is part of the New York City Museum of Anthropology or archeology, span because you have these banners up, which actually represent um, the exhibits that are being sh shown in the pavilion or rather in the building. And as you can see here, there's like the, something about the, the, the Mayan empires, another thing about the Chinese emperor and the soldiers and, uh, uh, and a bunch of other banners that I can't read. But at the end of the day, it has to do with ar archeological finds, okay, and history. So these banners are being placed up in front of the, uh, or around the uh, Hammond Pavilion, which means that this is part of the New York uh, um, uh, Museum of Archaeology. 
And as if you can see over here, there's a close shot. This is the same area because there's a car flipped. Moving on, let's go to the streets of New York City. And I mean, sorry, the streets of Montreal. And what we see here is this uh, rental truck which actually has a dinosaur bones being um, transported to another building. Um, and this is that building. I don't know what building this is in Montreal, but this is that building. Now they're transporting or rather putting these dinosaur bones into this building. This building is obviously not a museum in real life in Montreal, but this will be the setting for the museum. Uh, this will be standing in for the museum that's going to be in New York. Now let's take a look at some closer up shots. Uh, here, now here's a here's a shot from the outside through the window of the building, and then you can see some more dinosaur bones there. So they're totally making it out to be a museum of archaeology. Uh, what's very interesting is that, um, or rather, my theory is that the Hammond Pavilion and that lot outside at the uh, the Parc Jean Drapeau, that is the exterior of this. This. This, this, this museum looking setting, this, this, this interior, this is going to be shot for the interior. Once they go inside, so these two locations actually make up one location actually, or one setting, okay? So the outside is the Jean, uh, the Parc Jean Drapeau, and then what we have here is when they enter the building. When they enter the building, now we get the dinosaur bones. Okay, now we get all those, those, uh, those fossils. And that means that we're, they're going to be going in and out of the building. And uh, Elena's character, she's most likely going to be working inside. That's what I'm puzzling together. I don't think these are two separate locations. It's made to, um, I mean, right now we think of it as two separate locations because they take place in two different locations. But with the magic of movie magic and editing, once they enter the Ham Hammond Pavilion, this is it. They're inside this building with all the fossils. At least that's what I believe, okay? That's my theory. Let's move on and look at Maximal Caves. These are Maximal Caves that you see right here. This is the lot in which the Maximal Caves are being constructed. As you can see, there are other um, natural natural uh, structures being constructed on the side. Uh, here's another look at the mound that they're building. Um, and then let's take another closer look at the Maximal Cave. This is from shot from a drone. And as you can see right here, this is a giant um, they're calling it a, a drainage fissure, okay? This is a giant drainage fissure that is going to be a, um, like they're, they're building this, which is going to be part of um, like, a, like, a, a, like a set, like a location, and this will be ground level, okay? Obviously, they have to build it from the ground up, so it's going to be raised right now, but when it's being shot, uh, it's going to be ground level. So eventually, our characters, our heroes, our protagonists, they're going to have to go in. They're calling it the Maximal Cave. And so obviously something, I guess, uh, Noah and Elena, they find some information that leads them to the uh, to the uh, uh, the Maximal Cave. Um, they got either maps or some, some uh, MacGuffins that tell them that, uh, you know, these, these tools that tell them, it's like, kind of like an Indiana Jones thing. That's what I'm theorizing. They, they find these things that lead them on an adventure. They, they, they piece it together, just like in Transformers last night. This, this, this item right here, this artifact, indicates that we need to go here. Then they find this other artifact that leads, that tells them that they need to go here. Eventually they make their way to the Maximal Cave and then they have to go through this hole. Okay, probably with the help of the Autobots or uh, because they need to move this giant um, manhole <laughs> or they push a button, eventually it slides on its own, which would be pretty cool. That's like Indiana Jones style. And then they make their way down there. That would be really, really cool. All right. So I think that's what's going to happen. Let's take a look at more photos or screen grabs of Scourge. Okay, I'm not. I'm just assuming that this is Scourge. We don't 100% know that this is Scourge, but Transformers Alt Notes actually posted some Instagram video of um, of these uh, flame projectors. And it's not only one flame projector, but it's two flame projectors. Here's the first one, and here's the second one. And this is a video, um, but uh, I got these screen grabs of it, and these are two different uh, flame projectors, which um, hints that it's def it's it's possibly going to be um, Scourge because from what I read from that original set report from TFW, it said that it had four um, 
four, uh, 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 um, what is it? Those, uh, uh, smokestacks, four smokestacks. So I'm assuming that this is two of the four smokestacks that is blowing out flames. So, um, that's going to be very interesting. Or maybe when he transforms to a robot mode, uh, then flames come out of him to establish dominance. So that's really cool. Okay. Now we're going to talk about what I'm talking about, what I suggested in the title. And that is, this is our, our, uh, Cybertronian casualty. This is our first Cybertronian casualty and check out this wide shot here on the left. You see some busted cars above it. You see some like trailers and right below it, you see, uh, what looks like, uh, some like the, uh, the shape of a robot, but in blue. Okay. Now here's another shot of it from a different angle. Let's get a little bit more closer up. Now here's the thing. I don't know if this is the exact location where they're going to shoot it at, but at least the, um, this, the, the, the set design or the art department or who or the props department, the, 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 the carpenters, they have constructed, um, a version uh, of, of what's going to be shot or rather they constructed what's going to be shot on this lot right here. I don't know if it's going to move around or take place somewhere else, but on this very lot, we have busted cars. We have some debris, wood debris, and then we have what appears to be a, a downed robot, a downed Cybertronian. Let's take a closer look at it. Look at that right there. You can clearly see we got head, we got body, we got legs, we got limbs, we got arms, you know, and, and they're just all lying right there. And we're not seeing it 100% complete. It's got some, it, it's got a missing feet. It looks like its arm is torn apart. So this is a dead robot. Which one is it? Decepticon, Autobot, Maximal, Terracon? We don't know yet. But looking at this shape, this really weird shape, okay, with, with the round chest, what does that tell us? Okay. Um, I've seen Predacons and Maximals with the head of the animal that they represent on their chest. Could that be it? I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just throwing out suggestions. I'm not saying that that's what I believe, but that's a possible suggestion. Or it could be an Autobot or Decepticon or Terracon, which have a round chest. Could be anything. But at the end of the day, that's a downed robot, okay? It's not just any robot that is just getting up and he's just taking a nap. It's not that, okay? This is a robot that has been, that went through some kind of suffering and now he's down and he's toast because it's, his arms are are apart and it's blue because they eventually, um, the, the visual effects team, they're going to eventually render a CG robot right there on that very, very spot. Now, why is this so significant? Okay. Why, why would they create something like that as opposed to just not having that and just having a CG robot just lay there? Well, you got to look back at the previous films to know that answer. And that is, um, uh, look at the first film. Okay. You had Bumblebee, um, they created a statue of Bumblebee, which doesn't move. And the, it's there in the backdrop in the background. So that, uh, Sam and, uh, and, uh, uh, sector seven and, uh, Michaela, they can interact with it or at least act around it. They have something to act around. Okay. Well, they found that Michael Bay found that, well, that's looks silly. It just looks like a statue. It's a, it's a dead prop. He's not being very interactive and you can clearly tell that that is a, a, a statue or that's just a prop that doesn't even move. Okay. It looks very cheap. Okay. He even mentioned he was criticizing himself, his own movie for that. So what did they decide to do or what was more effective? They create a, a, um, like a blue screen version of a dead Optimus Prime in Revenge of the Fallen laying down in the desert. Okay. And why does it need to be a, um, why does it need to be a, a blue and why isn't it just a CG model, which does not exist in when they're making it? Well, it's because that the actors need to interact with it. It, it has to, the actors need something there so they can interact with it, such as climb on top of it. Just like how Sam Witwicky climbs on top of that blue Optimus Prime body and then he stabs it with the matrix of leadership. Okay. So this dead robot is going to be interacted with a human. I don't know if it's going to be Elena, Elena or Noah or police or military or whatever, but definitely there's going to be some sort of interaction with a human. Okay. Mark my words. Okay. That's why they create models like that. So if now we're beginning to puzzle the story together, maybe this robot is already toast. Maybe this is the aftermath of something that happened and then Noah and Atlanta run towards it and they're like, what the hell is this thing? What happened? And then they, or it's already lined, they're dead. And then he eventually climbs on top of it 
at the end of it all, um, they have something to perform to. They have something to act with for reference. So this is a significant piece, okay? This is not just any dead Cybertronian. They're gonna be interacting with it. The big question is, who is it? Let me know in the comment section below. It could be anybody. <laughs> but uh, it, it's such an interesting scene because um, this is, like obviously a battle took place here. We see cars that are beat up, all right? These cars are just beat up. So uh, they something obviously happened to them. Somebody took a beating, okay? Uh, somebody took a beating, which also re tells us that, you know, just like in every single one of these Transformers films, somebody has to die, okay? You cannot have a Transformers film without an Autobot dying, okay? Or, or uh, of course, Decepticons and bad guys are gonna die, but then the emphasis is the Autobots, the good guys dying, because every single film has an Autobot dying. Heck, even in Bumblebee, Cliff Jumper bit the dust, all right? Everybody's gotta die. Or at least in every film, somebody's gotta die. Sometimes even two Autobot characters, all right? So who is this gonna be? That's a very good question. Obviously, it's not gonna be RC, okay? It's too small to be RC, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. RC bit the dust in, the, in Revenge of the Fallen. She's not gonna bite the dust this time around, okay? So you don't have to worry about that. Who is it gonna be? I'm really, really curious, okay? And who does this character die by the hands of, okay? Is it uh, Nightbird or is it uh, uh, um, Scourge or whatever else is out there? Who knows? Anyways, this is, has been a really, really exciting chat. Uh, let me know in the comments section below what you think about all this. Um, I'm really, really excited. Be pumped. The hype is real. I am so happy that another Transformers live fraction film is in production right now because the journey is so exciting. I'm so thankful for you guys to continue this journey with me because I just want to have somebody to talk about this stuff with. At the end of the day, I am excited. I just want to share my excitement with you guys. I hope you guys are all excited. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter and uh, let's talk about it. All right. My name is Alex. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for the next episode and I'll see you next time. Peace.